I am looking at cities like Paris and Mayor Anne Hidalgo right. uh, and saying and, and, and thinking to myself, like, we need we need that level of boldness, that level of I'm doing it because it's the right thing. And this is my vision. Right. So and I mean, with, to that extent, a, yeah, and exactly. I was going to say, and with a sense of urgency. With a sense of urgency, exactly. Yeah. What has yeah. it been like? A hundred plus miles of yeah. protected bike lanes have gone yeah. in in the last two years. It, it's 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 phenomenal. Hey everyone, this is John with the Active Towns Channel, and that was Scott Bricker with Bike Pittsburgh, Bike PGH, <laughs> and uh, uh, Scott is actually one of the founders of the uh, the organization, Bike Pittsburgh organization, and uh, it is now. 20 years old and uh, it was such a pleasure to have Scott on the podcast and uh, we, we have a wonderful conversation talking about the great things that the city of Pittsburgh is moving forward and the, the role that advocacy has played there in the city over the years and uh, it's a nice long conversation as usual <laughs> so we'll get right to it. Uh, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Scott Bricker. Scott Bricker, it's such a pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me, John. Hey, uh, so you and I know each other from, you know, years of running into each other, uh, you know, at various conferences. And uh, I, I think we had the opportunity to brush shoulders uh, from time to time with some of the people for bikes types of events that are out there. Um, but uh, why don't you do this? Why don't you just give me a, a quick you know, thumbnail sketch of who Scott Bricker is and, and how you came to, to do this work. What makes me tick? Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, wow. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, important to start with, um, you know, I've, I'm a co-founder of Bike Pittsburgh and we're now 20 years old. Uh, I was in my uh, mid-20s when uh, we kicked off the whole uh, bicycle advocacy movement here in Pittsburgh. Um, and now I'm in my mid forties, uh, of course, and uh, we've come a long way in Pittsburgh. Um, personally, I, I don't know if I'm, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, that different from most people running these types of organizations. Um, I have a, just a, a real passion for, um, change making and uh, making my city more livable. Um, you know, I was also on the board of the Alliance for Biking and Walking uh, when that was still, uh, you know, that was still a functioning organization. And um, I feel like I, I gained a lot of knowledge from other people in the movement uh, during those, those uh, first 10 years, I'd say, on the job here at Bike Pittsburgh. Uh, but really, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, you know, all that special or interesting. Besides, I, think, you know? I think it's special, and I think it's interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. And uh, and you mentioned the alliance. So the alliance for for walking and biking. Uh, it was a, an alliance of of professionals, um, you know, doing work in this industry. And, uh, you know, that's where I started hanging out with you is, is you know, mm -hmm. during the 2012 um, uh, Alliance retreat. And then um, the uh, at the time that was pro walk, pro bike, eventually that uh, the name uh, of that particular conference that happens every other year uh, became uh, walk bike places, which is what it's called now. In 2014, you all were hosting and so you had uh, uh, basically everybody in to, to Pittsburgh for that conference. And I believe that was the last year of the Alliance, correct? It was 2014. I think that was the last retreat. It was that was the last retreat. But I okay. think we hung on for another, you know, almost a year after that. I mean, about a um, year. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but I guess it was I mentioned the Alliance just because um, that's where a lot of this knowledge sharing happened and where I, I gained a lot of, you know, good ideas for, you know, implementing in Pittsburgh. And, you know, we we famously stole from each other, um, right. all, you know, all these different biking and walking advocacy organizations nationwide or throughout North America, really. And, um, you know, that's how we you know, decided to, to really pursue open streets, um, right. you know, uh, some of our campaigns around protective bike lanes and things like that. Um, 
we, you know, our membership program, we, we learned a lot from other larger cities, um, you know, like San Francisco Bicycle Coalition and yeah. uh, organizations like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely made a dent here in Pittsburgh in those 20 years, um, mm -hmm. against all odds. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and what was fun about, uh, being able to be there in 2014 for the, the, the conference and, and, uh, it was the fact that it, it was just so cool to see, um, you know, the, the early stages. And I think there was like, you know, there was a pop-up protected, uh, bike lane over one of the main bridges. It happened to the be the bridge that I rode every morning. Cause I was staying in an Airbnb on the other side of the river. And so it was really cool to be able to pop up on, on my Brompton on that, and then go to the conference. Talk a little bit about that, um, that transformation that has been slowly incrementally happening in Pittsburgh since that 2014 hosting of the conference. Yeah. I, I'd have to go back and look at each year's, um, bike network, you know, uh, additions, um, since then. But, you know, I think on average we, we have grown our bike network between five and 10 miles a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the network has really evolved since the last time you were in Pittsburgh. Right. Um, well, in fact, hold on a second. Let me, let me pull up a graphic because I think I actually have a graphic here. <laughs> so this is actually more recent. This is just the network uh, within the last uh, you know couple of years. So really mm -hmm. from 2019 through uh, uh, 2000, you know, this year, uh, 2022. And so this mm -hmm. is kind of a, a little bit of an idea of, of how it's been happening in, in relationship to the final mile, which is really about really mm -hmm. trying to bridge some of those gaps that are existing in the network. And so you can really kind of see it on these these three maps. And I imagine that, you know, if we ran this back to 2014, it would look even different, even more different. Yeah, for sure. And we've even just in the last couple of weeks gotten two more pieces of that network in place in 2022. So yeah, a yeah. lot of the groundwork for 2022 was laid in 2020 and 2021 through um, the final mile program that you are showing your viewers right now, yeah. um, where we did like this very deep dive <laughs> collaboration with um, the Pittsburgh Bike Share. They run a system called Pogo yeah. and uh, the city of Pittsburgh to do an intensive uh, marketing and outreach uh, program, as well as just collaborative uh, bike network development program. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been it was uh, hugely intensive, <laughs> time intensive, and emotionally intensive. Um, all that was done essentially remotely during the pandemic. So you can imagine, right. you know how easy or not easy it is to collaborate via computer um you know multiple hours a week with yeah um you know the city um but we've you know we learned a lot and we uh, you know we ended up getting you know a couple dozen miles of bike infrastructure in place with even more plan for implementation this year right yeah yeah so you mentioned pogo so that is the the new um, bike share uh, system in, in Pittsburgh. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a rebranded bike share system uh, with all new equipment. Uh, they, they were using um, next, bike, uh, next bike technology out of Germany for the first, ooh, how many years? Close to 10 years. Um, and then they, uh, they got rid of that system. Uh, they were known as Healthy Ride then. They rebranded as Pogo. Uh, with the H because of uh, the H in Pittsburgh. I think that's pretty cute, actually. Um, and they use PBSC bikes now. Um, so uh, it's beautiful system. They're doing, um, what is it, 50% uh, are uh, pedal assist e-bikes. Um, and uh, they just finished launching last month, uh, and it's already just like catching on like wildfire, especially the e-bikes. 
Yeah, fantastic. And and I love the fact that so many of these bike share systems are putting in that electric assist uh, aspect to it. It's it, I think it's just a game changer because it, a there's the fun factor. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of that we factor. Yeah. You know, people just really love it. It's a it's a great little feedback. Uh, uh, and and really, I think that it, it was really the the dockless systems, the scooters and the, and the e-bikes that sort of got dropped into, you know, most of our cities that really sort of pushed, I think the dock based programs to, to move on getting that uh, electric assist out there. And, and I'm so glad to see that happening. Uh, we're seeing yeah, it here. For sure. in, yeah. We're seeing it yeah. here in Austin too, is that uh, they're trying to get that system transferred over and Oh, we were, I was talking with some folks uh, with Bosch. Uh, I was talking with Jocelyn uh, uh, with Bosch uh, about uh, the fact that uh, some of the cities are completely tra- transferred over. So we've got Santa Barbara, Boulder, and uh, Madison, Wisconsin, that are now completely uh, uh, B-cycle systems and Bosch systems that have been you know completely electric assist. So making a big yeah, difference. It- and you mentioned it being a game changer. Well, you can imagine what it's like in Pittsburgh, one of the hilliest, if not the yes. hilliest city in the United States, yeah. and how that can actually help bridge, you know, or flatten the hills, actually. Um, so, you know, we have a fairly tight city. It's 54 square miles or so. It's, it's oh. a pretty small. When you compare Austin, yeah. right, which is hundreds of square miles. 326. Um, <laughs> exactly. So we're a fraction of that, but we're right. also a very vertical city. And so, right. you know, the e-assist is really helping, um, you know, get, you know, get people up those hills, flatten right. the hills, um, you know especially now that it's 90 degrees here. And I think that that's probably the new normal in Pittsburgh. Um, You know, these very hot, humid days, people can go up those hills and, you know, arrive at their destination, you know, not (laughs) soaking wet with sweat. Not soaking wet. So I pulled up this image real quick. It's going to, it'll slide off in just a moment, but you mentioned open streets event. It's, it's happening this Sunday. What's the background, uh, you know, for Open Streets, uh, you know, and the story, the backstory for Open Streets in Pittsburgh? Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, we see Open Streets events as really experiential marketing. Here's what it could be like out there if cars didn't surround us <laughs> and breathe down our throats 24-7. Yeah. What if we had a more humane street grid? Um, what if we had a more people friendly transportation system? Um, but I think it's also it kind of, it, it allows people to see how close some of these distances are. Uh, a lot of people we've done, um, pre and post surveys where, um, you know, people think that these distances, you know, f- three to five miles, which is what we close down, are daunting distances to get to the store or get to work or, you know, recreate with their friends. And they they find that they do it three or four times. They get 15, right. 20 miles on themselves, you know, on their legs by the end of open streets along with their family and friends. Um, so we, you know, they... We've seen that um, the reaction or, or their answers to those questions, like, would you be more willing to ride to work now that you've experienced open streets is a resounding yes. So right, right. it's really interesting to see people's people want to adopt uh, riding a bike or walking more often as a result of open streets. Uh, but it's been wildly popular here in Pittsburgh. It's one of the largest event series in the city now. Hmm. So we've been doing it for a half dozen years or so. And we've grown it to, you know, tens of thousands of participants over three events. And we do it the last weekend of May, June and July. Uh, Um, Yeah. And, uh, you know, we choose different parts of the city. It just depends on um, a number of things. But uh, construction is is not the least of which (laughs) help us choose where we're going to be in any given year. Um, but, you know, we, we put a lot of time and effort into these events. Um, and the result has been just, it's, it's blown us away how popular it's become. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear the framing that you use there is it gives that opportunity to, to help people see their streets in a different way. 
mm-hmm. such an important part of it. It's not just it's not just about having a fun event. It, there is that, but really being able to to reinforce that you know, hey, you know, these are some of the things. These are some of the the concepts of if we can see our streets in a different way. Uh, hey, wouldn't it be nice if it, there our streets were more people friendly? year round. Now we saw that a lot. Uh, we haven't had open streets in, in Austin um, in, in quite some time, but we, we did see a lot of the change in terms of the, the way people related to their streets uh, based on the pandemic. Did you see much of that as well in, in Pittsburgh in terms of like kind of reimagining what streets are for due to, you know, some, some of the out, uh, you know, some of the, the, uh, outcomes or, or changes that happened during the pandemic? Uh, to a certain extent, I think, you know, just like everywhere around the world, bikes flew off shelves here, right. um, you know, especially the the lower price bikes and, you know, people dusted off the bikes that, you know, they may have had in their basements. We saw, you know, in the first two or three months of the pandemic, just you know, we didn't do a count, but let's just say thousands of people riding. Um, and, you know, th- I think a lot of people have said that the silver lining of the pandemic during those first few months was just how many fewer people were driving to get around and how many more people were outside walking and biking and running and uh, using the streets in new ways. Uh, the city and with the help of People for Bikes and Bike Pittsburgh, uh, tried to do, uh, you know, what they're calling open streets, a different style of open streets than the event style open streets, but open streets meaning like uh, slow streets, um, especially on on uh, residential streets. And I think it could have been it could have been done a little bit uh, better here in Pittsburgh. We only used <clears throat> sort of plastic A frames with some some traffic cones, where we saw. Um, huge success nationally were those cities that put up like serious barricades preventing right, yeah. cars from yeah, going yeah. down the streets. So I think, you know, it, it was really great. It was a great attempt and we were very supportive of it, but I think you just need to, you know, in retrospect, uh, really think out the type of equipment you need to keep cars from driving on streets. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, it was great. It was great that um, the city, was also seeing those changes or people that demand uh, that, you know, it's just not there in a typical month or year uh, in a non-pandemic setting. Right. Um, and, and, and actually try to meet it with supplying, you know, <laughs> meet that demand with supplying safer streets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I'd like to do is, um, play a, a, this video that uh, the people for bikes put out uh, the the two days on two wheels uh, Pittsburgh I think you have a little interview and there a little cameo <laughs> in, in in that particular video and uh, um, it, it's it's very well done and you know very very high level of, of, of production value Um in the beginning, I'll, I'll turn. I'll keep the sound down in the beginning, and then I'll turn the sound up uh, during the, the the interview interviews. But while this is playing, if you wouldn't mind, just you know, kind of reflect on, uh, you know, kind of what you're seeing out there, uh, you know, because this is a really nice reflection. This is a recent production. This is a manifestation as to kind of like what's been happening over the last few years. So I think it's a great way to sort of celebrate where you guys are at and where you're headed. Uh, again, this is a, a, a wonderful new video that's just uh, been put out there. Um, so re- reflect a little bit about, you know, what has happened in the, in the past few years that has you know, really kind of led to where we're at now in Pittsburgh. And I, I, there's some great images right here. <laughs> so, sure. Well, I think yeah. you have to rewind a, a little bit more than a few years back to when uh, Mayor Tom Murphy was in office and he established the, the Riverfront Trail system, the Three Rivers. It's called the Three Rivers Heritage Trail. Yeah. And that really uh, became the backbone of the bike network. There were only three other bike lanes in the entire city when that wow. <laughs> when okay. that hit, and now there's about a hundred miles of on street bike network now. Uh, so, and that's all been in the you know more recent years. I'd say in the last 
especially the last decade. Um, you know, and I think it's really exciting to bring the network onto the streets because the streets connect you to more places that you need to go and right. using your bike as transportation. Um, the trail system can act as either sort of a highway or a recreational uh, route. Um, but the on-street network, it'll get you to, you know, your friends' homes, to dinner, yeah. to the grocery store, to work, um, you know, to the, the post office, you know, to really meeting all of your needs. Uh, and we've, we've seen just leaps and bounds in that on-street network, uh, you know, get, get put down, some temporary stuff. You're showing, you know, like a magnum opus sort of <laughs> piece of built infrastructure. Um, That's the reason I paused on it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really impressive. This was just, you know, chock full of cars uh, through University of Pittsburgh's campus. Um, so this is a beautiful raised uh, unidirectional in each direction mm -hmm. uh, cycle track uh, that connects uh, another protected bike lane on the other side near a little park called Shenley Plaza mm -hmm. um, with another part of the bike network. Uh, and then that's getting built on. Uh, it's really started right now and it's going to be done by 2024. The yeah, bus okay. rapid transit, there's a bus rapid transit project in Pittsburgh that's going to connect the, the neighborhood of Oakland to downtown Pittsburgh. And part of that, thanks to bike Pittsburgh's advocacy and, and making sure our members' voices were heard and, you know, hundreds of others. Uh, it, there's going to be a protected bike lane network as part of the bus rapid transit uh, project that connects these two communities. Um, so that's about three or four miles uh, more of protected bike lane uh, network that's going to tie into what you're showing your, your viewers right. right now. Yeah, fantastic. And I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll press play on this because I think Kim Lucas is going to say a few words and, and uh, sure. give our, our voices a, a break for a moment. So let's hit uh, hits play again. Improved bicycle infrastructure. By making it easier and safer to ride bikes, it means that there's one less barrier to people making that choice. We don't want in Pittsburgh, for the reason that you're not taking a bike for a trip, to be because you don't think there's a safe way for you to do so. By having more safe places, more trails, more on-street connections that actually get people where they need to go it means more people are going to ride bikes. And what that translates to is a benefit for everybody. So, you know, if, yeah. if you don't mind me narrating a little bit. <laughs> All I was going to say really quickly before we, we put it on, put the spotlight on me yeah. <laughs> is, um, I mean, that's music to my ears. Kim, yeah. Kim Lucas, um, yes. Director Lucas, she's in charge of our mobility and infrastructure department for the city of Pittsburgh. So essentially, that's our DOT, Pittsburgh DOT. Right. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's new in the last five or six years. Um, ah, and, okay. and to have the director of that department yeah. say those things yeah. is really meaningful. And newly that means confirmed, too. Newly, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, she was the assistant director right. under the previous mayor, and she was just um, she was just promoted under the new mayor, yeah. uh, Mayor Ed Ganey. And uh, you know, when directors uh, their values and you know their interests and and you know, uh, I'd say their goals align with ours. That's where magic happens. Yeah, you know, we're yeah. at, we're. At, uh, advocacy and and official city departments can actually get a lot done in the name of street safety, livability, um, and you know getting more people riding bikes more often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent point. And we'll we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit. But uh, even when all the stars are aligned and you've got good leadership and and uh, you know at, at the, the staff side, the admin side, but also the politicians, it's still difficult to, to, to do things. And, and we'll, we can address that in just a moment. <laughs> yeah, because so. you still need money. <laughs> well, <laughs> even when you have money, yeah. you, yes. You, the, uh, the, I guess, yeah, you know, speaking you, from Austin's point of view, where you have yeah. uh, sort of endless sums of funding for transportation projects at the yes. moment. Well, we, we happen to be one of the cities that, you know, the the... The voters basically, you know, 
tax themselves, decided right. to, to, to put forth bonds to be able to do that. Um, but of course, this challenge still is, is change is difficult and being able to, to really see change through is, is yeah. one of those challenges that we have. And so, you're speaking yeah. to the culture. Yeah. Culture yeah. change is always very difficult. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of culture, we have, what, what is this building that we've paused on? <laughs> oh, this is the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. There you go. Some culture. All right, well, let's, uh, let's continue with this. I think people who give it a shot see just how exhilarating it is, how fun it is. And there's really different types of infrastructure for everyone, from car-free trails to protected bike lanes to traffic calm neighbor ways. To just regular bike lanes those gaps in the network are getting filled and there's more and more people riding every day so you're going to feel part of a community doing it love it <laughs> love it um i I'm, I'm such a sucker for 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 that stuff you know you'd think that i produce videos myself <laughs> so, um but uh you, you you said it right there. You know, it's that that network. It's it's piecing it together with a, a lot of different types of, of infrastructure. One of the things that was mentioned there was the the quieter neighborhood, uh, you know, bikeway or greenway types of uh, environments. And I think when I looked yeah. at the statistics, that's one of the 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 highest um, mileage uh, counts. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So in other cities, they're called bicycle boulevards. In the the hometown of uh, Mr. Rogers, we call them neighborways, and uh, it really is an important part of the bike network. It's side streets that get you off of you know busier streets that connect you to uh, other communities, to parks, to work, to shopping, uh, things like that. Um, the city experimented a lot in the last few years with uh, different types of traffic calming from speed humps to uh, neighborhood traffic circles, uh, some to uh, greater, a greater degree of success than others. Uh, it turns out when there aren't any traffic circles in a city and you introduce them, people have uh, strong reactions about that. I mean, I would actually sort of love like to see... Sort of like that cultural yeah. change thing yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want me to do what at an intersection? Go right. around a, a circle? What? Is, yeah, so um, definitely saw some... Uh, <laughs> the speed bump metaphor uh, actually applies to the traffic circles. Right, there right. were some speed bumps to getting traffic circles in place. Right, right. Um, but, you know, I would love to see... It, the, the speed humps are hugely popular for the most part in Pittsburgh. Everybody complains about cars speeding, drivers mm -hmm. speeding down their streets. Um, those are going to make the biggest difference. Those are the most popular. I would love to see us do more things like what you see in the Netherlands, like chicanes or right. double speed humps near schools. Um, you know, more plantings and, and things that uh, kind of narrow the field of vision for drivers, uh, you know, <clears throat> play around with different textures to our streets, but all of this costs, you know, a lot of money. And uh, Pittsburgh is a, is a city of 300,000 people. It's pretty small. We lost half of our population in the, in the seventies and eighties um, right, right. because the steel industry collapsed. And there was a great Pittsburgh diaspora where people went all over the United States. I'm sure, you know, people in Austin who are sure. from Pittsburgh, everybody has a, has a Pittsburgh story or Pittsburgh right. relative. Um, and that's because we lost, half of our population. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's, I think we're a comeback story. It's, it's a beautiful city. Yeah. You've been here. It's one of the most beautiful cities in America. Uh, but it's also very, um, resource, uh, resource limited. Right. Right. And so, you know, as much as I would love to do, you know, 20 neighbor ways a year or something like that in the city of Pittsburgh, we, we have to make, you know, a, a serious case for spending, you know, those millions of dollars on, on, uh, traffic calm streets that the city's not used to spending. Like it, right. it, it and it's really great to see, uh, how recently, uh, we have made huge inroads to increasing the budget for safe streets in the city of Pittsburgh. Right. It's about 10 times more than when we started this organization. Um, uh, but that's not nearly enough. 
And yeah. we need to see more state and federal dollars to, uh, you know, coming into the city to, to help. Yeah. Yeah. So I pulled up this chart. I think I was misremembering uh, what, what was on what was represented on the chart. It does, mm-hmm. uh, you know, indicate that the majority of the, the network at this point um, is, in fact, some of those shared use paths. And I, I would imagine that uh, based on what I remember of that network, you know, that's a lot of the waterfront paths and, and some others. Uh, and then, of course, you've got your bike lanes. Now, is this your 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 typical bike lane um, at 33 percent at this point? I can't read what's on your screen, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can read, <laughs> I can okay. read that. It says 33% um, and mm-hmm. it says bike lanes and then 11% neighbor ways and then 11% protected uh, bike lanes. And then the 7% yeah. is buffered bike lanes. So it seems to me that that 33% uh, that's uh, second on the yeah. rung there is like your standard painted bike lane. Standard. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's that's correct. Yeah, so we're, we're still not quite at that uh, that level of all ages and abilities, you know, uh, facility for there, but it looks like the, the protected at 11%, that's probably what you've seen, you know, quite a bit of increase in. And uh, I'm assuming the buffered bike lanes are, or something that you've seen some increase in over the last few years as well. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, personally, I would say that, um, the protected bike lanes, the neighbor ways and the trail system, um, all comprise sort of the all ages and abilities right. network. Um, to a certain extent, the the buffer bike lanes do yeah. too. Although yeah. I, you know, yeah. all that's missing are are the. I, I like to call. Well, well we the, we start calling uh, uh, vertical paint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, well, you know, that's not the ultimate goal, and yeah. I I'm saying that in jest for the most part. Yeah, I, um, I say but, I, I'm, we're yeah. on the same page because I say the same thing. It's like the, the the real value of the buffered bike lane is we it's that that incremental step, you know, again, due to the, the mm-hmm. backlash and the cultural change and mm-hmm. that shift of being able to at least cordon that real estate off to then be protected at some point in the future. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's that's more comfortable, and then um, you know the the painted bike lanes and the sharrows, which I don't even think that they uh, put on there, which is also a significant portion of our yeah. uh, on street network. Um, but the share the sharrows work a lot better when you add speed humps and other traffic calming to them, right. and, and the city is is doing more and more of that. So up up to and I don't have the latest mileage here. Um, Neighborways, neighborways. The the term neighborways is a specific uh, typology of street in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it's almost always on a residential street, but there's plenty of streets that aren't residential necessarily that mm-hmm. have speed humps on them too. That right, aren't right. neighborways that are part of a traffic calmed network of streets as well. So, uh, what I was going to say is I don't know the exact number of speed humps that the city has put in but we fought really hard at bike pittsburgh i'd say 10 to 12 years ago to get the very first on-street speed humps in place um in pittsburgh uh there there are these nasty rumors that speed humps were illegal you can't put speed humps on a street it's illegal Hmm. well we did a lot of advocacy we did a lot of research and we we finally over the course of about a year got the city to admit that that's not the case it's not illegal right. and then we worked with a city councilman to get uh some of the first speed humps in place yeah. and then it took um domi getting started department of mobility and infrastructure you heard from kim, kim lucas to to uh, make it into a program uh, traffic there's a traffic calming program that right. citizens that neighbors can apply for here in pittsburgh to get speed humps on their streets and there's dozens and dozens and dozens of those projects that have been implemented in the last three to five years so that i, I just i just think like that's not um that wasn't put onto your screen that was in in the the people yeah. for bikes sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Net- network analysis, right, but right. it's also really important for the overall uh, safety and livability of our streets because yeah. you know this about bike networks. People don't stick to them all the time. They don't go exactly where you need to go 100% right. of the time. So you need every street to be uh, bike and pedestrian friendly if possible. So yeah. so that's not exhibited in, your, in in that analysis that you showed. Yeah, and and in fact, if I were to criticize or critique the the bike 
network analysis tool, it misses so much of the rich, uh, safe, quiet streets that, you know, just don't get accounted for. You know, I, I mm -hmm. literally just minutes before uh, we, we started talking today was looking at the Austin and, and zoomed in on my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it, they basically consider, you know, our streets right outside the door in the red category, uh, it, it, sort of an equivalent to uh, a, a strode. I'm like, oh. you know, yeah. <laughs> we have no sidewalks, but it's yeah. a traffic calmed environment. You know, pedestrians and people riding bikes, you know, far outnumber the people driving. Uh, it's incredibly comfortable. And mm -hmm. but the, the criticism isn't necessarily, you know, just to uh, the BNA tool or to cities mm -hmm. that don't, you know, put that as part of their their network but it is the reality that our quiet neighborhood streets um frequently they are neighborhood streets and, and residential streets are one of the most pleasant places for people to ride and yet they don't show up on anybody's yeah. bike map and it's it's one yeah, of my biggest pet peeves yeah i think so. it's hard to get the nuance with any yeah. sort of sort of tool that you know someone's up or a business or an organization is is looking to be able to be applied universally correct so yeah. you know they do interviews with people there's a survey yeah. tool that they try to integrate yeah. but it's still yeah. it's kind of like you got to be here you got to yeah. like you gotta, spend spend three days with us yeah. and let us show you and then yeah. and and work that into your model yeah so i i i feel you i, I well I and, and the reality saying. the reality of of the fact that yeah there may be a, a, a bike lane right over here and it might even be a protected bikeway but if it's right next to heavy traffic, you know, again, one block over on a quiet residential street that has connectivity might be just absolutely delightful, you know, and, and might even be, you know, have a tree canopy to it. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, it, it's one of the, the challenges that we have there. So one of the, the key things that you all do, um, like many advocacy organizations around the country and around the world, is other outreach programs and engagement activities. Uh, one that always brings a smile to my face are when, you know, you do bike valet and, and, and programs like that. Talk a little bit about that, you know, and the outreach of, uh, of these types of, of programs and initiatives and outreach uh, uh, things that really help bring it to life for people, you know, and, and start changing their, their habits and showing yeah. up to events. I love bye bye. our bike yeah. valet yeah. so much. I'm, <laughs> I'm really thankful that you, you picked up on this because um, it's a way to do outreach and provide a service of value to people riding bikes, right? It's, it's not just setting up a table and, saying like come talk to us about yeah. you know you know our sort too, of but. yeah exactly we do we do that of yeah. course but but this is a way to do that and provide a service yeah. and um you know you, what you just showed was uh, our bike valet at the three three rivers arts festival um which just happened last week uh in the week prior uh we parked hundreds of bikes and it was actually located in a pretty uh inconvenient spot so you know where they found sp uh, space for us right because uh, they they moved the festival from point state park to a different part of downtown um was actually two or three blocks from the the main part of the arts festival and we still parked hundreds and hundreds of bikes yeah. um so you know people love it it's a coat check for bikes and yeah. um you know we're able to um interact with people with exactly the tool <laughs> we're able to interact with people about our advocacy and programs with the people who definitely have bikes definitely care about our mission and to some degree they're experiencing it so it's really invaluable for us to be able to uh to do that um now that covid's over we're you know we have two major bike valets uh that one that you just showed and another one coming up with a concert series nice and uh yeah we're excited to be back um covid was really tough for uh, you know on outreach for yeah. all sorts of organizations and ours was definitely uh a casualty yeah yeah now you uh 
earlier this month, you had the opportunity to go to Montreal. And you follow me on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I, I, I sure do. Here you are on Twitter. And um, uh, I love this event. This is this is a Tour de la Nuit. And so on mm-hmm. Friday night uh, in, in the, the first week in June, uh, Montreal throws two different events, uh, Tour, Tour La Nuit and uh, Tour de, de Io. And mm-hmm. uh, absolutely fabulous um, event of just really, it's, it's a great way to, uh, to kick off the summer, you know, from mm-hmm. their perspective and just, and, and really invite the entire city, the entire region uh, to, you know, join in the joy of the bicycle. Talk a little bit about that experience. What was that like? Uh, I mean, it was absolutely magical. Um, there's about 10 plus thousand people who ride in it. I think yeah. at their peak, peak pre COVID, they had as many as 15,000 people riding yeah. in the tour de nuit. And, um, I've never seen so many people, you know, at a mass start like that before. And, you know, Velo Quebec, they, they do amazing work. Um, in so many ways, I want to model bike Pittsburgh after them. We're, (laughs) we're, we're a 10 person, uh, 10 full-time equivalent organization. They're an 80 uh, full-time equivalent. Plus I think they, they get as many as, uh, another 40 during their, you know, their busy months. So very different organizations, very different budgets, very oh, yeah. different cities. Um, the city, I think it helps that Montreal, uh, I think the values of the citizens who live there, um, they have a real joie de vivre and they celebrate, they have you know dozens of festivals throughout the year. Yeah. This is essentially their bike festival, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is... Uh, I, I would I would absolutely um, adore putting on rides like they're doing in Montreal. Yeah. Um, it's 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 uh, we've looked into it. It's um, to say it's challenging is an understatement here. Yeah, it's essentially like putting on a marathon. So yeah. you know yeah. the the cost balloon, the amount of volunteers you need, or in the uh, hundreds, if not thousands, uh, oh, for sure. Police. For sure. Uh, I know that you do, they don't have to pay for police uh, to to yeah. uh, for these rides yeah, up yeah. in um, Montreal, whereas yeah. we would have to pay. Yeah. I think it's fifty fifty dollars an hour for an hour, hundreds yeah. of police. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's it's beautiful. It was it was um, uh, you know, I loved the the festival atmosphere of people wearing you know. Yeah. glow jewelry and you know people with their own boom boxes and you know there was a you just showed a photo or the video of the party bus the party bus yeah um, the party yeah. bus is there <laughs> and uh you know there's they have these uh rest stops that are really well um activated mm-hmm. uh we yeah okay so this is a video of descending down into the olympic stadium in right. montreal yeah. uh which just felt so cool. Um, yeah, yeah they, so this and is they had, what, 1972, right? Or 76? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was, it was 70. What was it? 70s. 76. It was 76. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was amazing. Yeah. It was, it, it was so wonderful. I was honored to be able to do that uh, back in, I think it was 2018 was uh, when I had a chance to, to be there. And, and, uh, what an amazing organization, as you mentioned. I've, I've had Jean-Francois Rowe on, on the podcast. And so mm-hmm. uh, for folks, if you haven't seen that episode, you got to go back and take a look at it. He talks a lot about the organization and uh, and he's a, a recently um, a new hire to to the president role. Um, two years ago. Yeah, yeah two years so he, ago. It, yeah. it was about a month before COVID lockdowns right. happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the funny thing was, too, is when I was there in 2018, uh, one of the best video clips that I got ended up being his son dancing with the the mascot cow at the at the start of uh, Tour de <laughs> la Nuit. So it was, it was hilarious. So, That's great. Um, but the other reason why I want to bring up Montreal is because in North America, that is one of our 
the top, if not the top, in terms of walking and biking and creating streets for people. Reflect on some of the things that you saw there that were really uh, maybe inspiration that you brought back to Pittsburgh. Sure. So I've been there about a half dozen times over the years, and um, I've taken a lot back to Pittsburgh. Uh, I think it's really important to note that uh, they have hills and they have winter. So <laughs> they have arguably a, um, a winter that's way, way worse than uh, Pittsburgh does. I think that's uh, literally what you said in this quote. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think it's important to start there because, yeah. Yeah. you know, you always hear, you know, from culturally speaking, like the naysayers, well, yeah. we can't do that here because X, right? And those the, the X in Pittsburgh is typically uh, hills in, in winter. winter. Yeah. Um, but they have hills and they have winter there and they have this beautiful protected bike lane network. They have uh, traffic calmed side streets. Um, yeah. A lot of what they do is, you know, they don't allow parking on both sides of a street. So yeah. they, you know, they'll um, they'll use that extra real estate to actually make the street safer for more people, for more users. Yeah. Um, I think that there's also something in the water there that just... Um, <laughs> You know, that je ne sais quoi, uh, that uh, just, and it, it might be linked to the poor weather, the, mm -hmm. the winter, that as soon as the weather gets nice, just everybody is outside. Um, so you just see it, it culturally, um, it's less of a lift because there's so many more people doing it. Now, of course, that's related to the infrastructure and right. bike parking and, uh, you know, these. Uh, uh, these huge events like, you know, Tour de Ile and Tour it, de I would Louis. Also, I would um, also uh, yeah. jump in and say it's also about political will, too. I mean, and here here will. you've got a post that says, you know, they're about to pedestrianize, uh, you know, this area here. And, and that was what it was like while you were there. Oh, yeah. It was actually one of the more uncomfortable streets that right. I was on. And we yeah. were just I think we were just bike or no, sorry, we were walking uh, there when we, when we saw that sign. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure they get yeah. backlash. And so you have to have thick skin. You have to have that political will of saying, no, we're doing this. It's going to be in place. It's going to be pedestrianized for, for three months and mm -hmm. find a way around, tough. you know, tough. tough. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it takes political will. It takes, um, you know, really good outreach to the business community, it takes some allies within the business community to be able to champion it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think th there was something else that somebody just posted on Twitter in the last week showing, um, uh, I think it was, uh, it was Amsterdam, um, if, I, if I recall, um, saying that, you know, people, people freaked out about, you know, taking away parking there too. Oh yeah. It wasn't an easy fight. Yeah. Um, but then you do it and you see, um, just how many more people go to these shopping areas and go, you know, spend their money and, 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 and stay and, and spend time at these places, right. which is really important too. And I don't think we, we think about that enough is, um, you know, the place make, making aspect of, of these things that actually uh, add a lot of vibrancy to these different business districts. Yeah, yeah. So you are a membership organization, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, you, you helped uh, found it uh, 20 years ago. Is, is literally this year your 20 year anniversary? Mm -hmm. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. And you are a membership based organization too. We Talk are. a little bit about um, what it means to become a member. So uh, for, for those in the audience that are tuning in from Pittsburgh, if you're not already a member, uh, Scott's going to tell you why you should become a member. Yeah. So much like NPR, it's our most important revenue stream. It's, <laughs> uh, it's sustainable um, in terms of, you know, bringing in uh, much needed dollars to the organization every month and every year. We have about 3,000 dues paying household members right now. Uh, and we're trying to grow that over, over the next handful of years to be 4,000. Um, and, you know, one, it, here's why it's important besides the sustainable revenue streams, which 
keeps us working full time towards, you know, uh, safer streets and more educated drivers and, and bicyclists um, and, you know, fun, fun, free community events like open streets. It really um, shows our elected officials that there's a huge appetite for these types of changes uh, that we're advocating for. Um, you know, when I say there's 3,000 members, that's more members uh, than, you know, I, I'd say like the, the Democratic Committee in Allegheny County might have 3,000 members. So, and we're a Democratic town, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so like, you know, those numbers are meaningful uh, yeah. to, to our elected officials. Yeah, yeah. And I see that uh, there's there's some membership benefits to it, and there I, I think that there's also something to be said about the camaraderie too of you know having an opportunity to not just be a dues paying member, but also I'm sure there's plenty of opportunity for volunteers, uh, like say at mm -hmm. the bike valet and other opportunities. Is that correct? Yeah, so we have a barter membership. Uh, you can volunteer for us. I think it's 10 hours and mm -hmm. you can earn a membership. So um, we have uh, uh, limited income and senior membership uh, d do dues as well. Um, and then we have, you know, you can be a donor over and above. There's lots of different ways to donate to the organization. Uh, you can also, like I said, you can donate um, and not become a member. A few people do that. Just um, sure. that's yeah. where they are. And we meet people where they are. Um, membership is like that, that camaraderie thing. You get a card. Yeah. You yeah. get to say you're a card carrying member. You get yeah. discounts at, you know, a couple dozen places or maybe three dozen places in Pittsburgh that support our mission by giving our, our members a discount. Um, and then you get discounts from our events off of our events as well. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, we give our members, um, special priority and, and, and lower, uh, lower fees or lower, um, you know, uh, rates on various things like, you know, right. pedal Pittsburgh, for example. Right. Right. Good stuff. Scott, is there anything that we haven't covered yet that you really want to leave the audience with? I, so, I mean, one of the, we've talked about our advocacy, we've talked about our um, community building events. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about our education uh, okay. department. So mm -hmm. we do uh, youth education, adult education, um, part of, you know, uh, we do videos that have been watched hundreds of thousands of times, little bite size. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> little bite size, one minute videos. Um, I, I don't know, even remember how many we have, but I would say if you click that l educational video link, you're going to see, um, you know, two or three dozen uh, one minute videos on how to use various parts of our bike infrastructure no, I think that this, to, this yeah. probably was very, very helpful during uh, COVID, I would think. Yeah, we had thousands of people watching these videos during yeah. the last two, two years. So, yeah, yeah. you know, um, yeah, I, I think, like I say, we try to meet people where they are. Not everyone's going to come to a three hour intensive uh, city cycling class on a weekend. Right. Um, but they could spend 10 minutes watching 10 different videos on our website. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, be a better, safer cyclist and driver as a result. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I'm actually going to press play. We're going to take a look at a little bit of this because this is actually when we look at this, this is uh, what we were talking about earlier is it's one of the, the neighbor ways. So very cool. This is this one. I think was like three minutes long, and it looks like it's sped up just a little bit. But it, you know, to, to be able to get it moving and and, and do mm -hmm. that is the intent to to also um, help educate folks of oh yeah it is okay where to go. This is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. How to access it? Uh, yeah. What the route is meant to? How it's supposed to um, connect? street to street right uh pittsburgh is not a grid city we <laughs> okay all right we, uh so it's more of like a uh, spaghetti bowl mm -hmm. of street city right uh they wind around um so it, you don't typically get on one street and stay on it for very long right yeah yeah 
It's good stuff. So earlier we we talked a little bit about uh, you know the political side and the value mm-hmm. of having you know strong leadership. Uh, you've gone through several different mayors in your 20 years. <laughs> Five. We're yeah. on our fifth mayor. Yeah. Boom. There you go. <laughs> um, but give, give a little little indication, you know, some wise wisdom for, for cities uh, around the globe that are looking at being able to, to, to have an impact and, you know, engage a community. Um, how, how do you really get all of those levels of of having community engagement and advocacy and then um you know hopefully achieving you know having strong leadership having the political support and then getting you know somebody who it looks like with kim you've got somebody you know at the the highest levels um within the city administration um to be able to implement it get it going any wise wisdom to leave everybody with you know sort of in that realm of stitching it all together because it's one thing to be advocates out there and, and screaming and begging and pleading, but it's mm-hmm. a far another uh, to be able to, to get to this level where you're a- able to like all, all cylinders are firing and stuff is getting put yeah. on the ground. God, if I had that figured out, John, <laughs> I, think, uh, um, I, I could make a lot of money being a consultant to so is it just cities all over the world. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think, I, I, I think I, it's multi-pronged. I, I think what it is, is like, there's a, it's a, it's a soup with many ingredients in it. And, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a, an ingredient of collaboration. There's an ingredient of, um, you know, electoral, uh, advocacy and politics, um, you know, within your 501c3, of course, but educating your constituents and educating the elected, the the people running for office on what your platform is and to encourage them to take it up. Uh, there's, um, activating your constituency, uh, (laughs) which is a nice way to say like getting loud sometimes. Um, and then there's community building, there is um, media work and making sure there's uh, good stories that are being told about this infrastructure and your organization. Uh, there's, um, you know, bringing people together to experience the streets through things like open streets or bike rides of any any type. Um, and I think that there's there's a role outside of like at the table style bike advocacy. There's a role for things like critical mass. There's a role for, you know, other organizations to play that might be louder than you can be or, or are. And, and I, I love that about Pittsburgh is that we have this like really vibrant bike community. It's not just one thing. We, we definitely are, um, you know, we, we have the seat at the table at bike Pittsburgh, I'd say. Um, but there's a lot of other people doing really cool work. Uh, and, you know, I'd say the last thing is putting as much of a local face and name to it as possible. So we've helped uh, start and have encouraged um, these neighborhood bike ped advisory committees to start all over uh, Allegheny County. A lot of them are That's in the great. city of Pittsburgh and they're they're. Uh, communicating directly with their city council people and submitting yeah. budget requests for their neighborhoods, um, you know, in addition to what Bike Pittsburgh is doing, uh, you know, sort of as the the citywide uh, special interest group. So I think that's the soup that we've uh, created in Pittsburgh, and I yeah. think it's been it's been successful to a certain extent. Um, I, I, you know, that said. I am looking at cities like Paris and Mayor Anne Hidalgo right. uh, and saying and, and, and thinking to myself, like, we need we need that level of boldness, right. that level of I'm doing it because it's the right thing. And this is my vision. Right. So and I mean, with, to and that extent, a, yeah, and exactly. I was going to say and with a sense of urgency. With a sense of urgency, exactly. Yeah. What has yeah. it been like? A hundred plus miles of yeah. protected bike lanes have gone yeah. in in the last two years. It, it's yeah. it's it's phenomenal. And so, what we're trying to do is, if we, you know, um, I think I think Mayor Ganey is is good on our issues. I don't think uh, he necessarily thought like I want to be the most bike friendly mayor in the United States, and I want Pittsburgh to be the most bike friendly 
city in the United States. Um, but to the extent that we can encourage him to take up that mantle right. is that's our task. And that's our, we, we are setting out to prove that these will be popular uh, decisions. Um, these will be popular uh, projects at the city level. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we've got the city's back um, and we're going to be encouraging them <laughs> to, to, well, to continue a, on this path. It's a fine line, isn't it? You know, it's like mm-hmm. you're, you, as you, you mentioned earlier, you know, it's, uh, you may not have the luxury of, of allowing yourself to be frustrated to the point to be overly loud. And, and it's kind of the, mm-hmm. the example I use is that there's a role for activism there's a role for advocacy and then there's mm-hmm. you know obviously the the need for for top level leadership and right. you know and solid administrative uh implementation mm-hmm. of things um and, and so there if you have a working you know positive relationship with the city <laughs> as the entity that is the city um mm-hmm. you can't be a bomb throwing, you know, activist necessarily, but there is a role for, for the, that activism. And you, I think you mentioned it you, and, and spoke to that quite elegantly is that, you know, eloquently is that there is a, a, a place for the critical mass. There is a place for mm-hmm. demonstrations. There is a place for uh, expressing frustration and saying, this isn't happening fast enough. We need to do better. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you navigate that? at times i mean it's got to be you you you, you've been you've been at this for two decades any advice that you would give to some of our uh, friends you probably know them on bike twitter that are just at their ropes (laughs) yeah at their wits end yeah yeah and i'm having these conversations actively with some of those people right um and we have these these conversations just about every week inside our office is you know where are we on this project? Where's the city? Has the city responded on you know this request? Or you know we're we're seeing a lot of complaints about X on Twitter, and we've been cc'd on you know Y emails. Um, so what? How, how can we use our um, you know our contacts, our network, uh, and our sort of power as an organization to? to get answers in a timely manner, to communicate, uh, to problem solve, help problem solve. Maybe we've also helped uh, on a number of occasions fundraise for various uh, bike efforts, whether it's um, uh, bike share or uh, key pieces of bike infrastructure. Um, Bike racks on the front of every bus, we helped fundraise for that. Um, So we have this long history of helping figure out solutions to problems. Um, so I think that is, that is something that we've also had success at. And, um, you know, we talk about all of those different tactics, all those different strategies, like here's what worked in this situation that's similar to this. Can we try that again? Or can we, uh, do we have to do something else? Or can we solve this problem ourselves by, you know, for example, like, uh, we were just talking about putting up um, some traffic cones where some old flex posts were taken out during a construction project and not right. put in. Yeah. Uh, so we were we were this close uh, to just putting out some some traffic cones to prevent people from parking in it while right. the city figured out how to get their contractor to reinstall the right. flex posts. Right. Th- they figured it out um, yeah. <laughs> along with the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, but. You know, those are all things that are on the table to help uh, solve problems in the, in the city of Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I think it's really important that you said, you know, uh, how important it is to have administrative people, right? So yeah. the people who are running Domi, who work at Domi, uh, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, um, just about every person doing design and engineering and the director ride bikes to work. I mean, nice. that's nice amazing so that's huge right like they don't just have windshield vision they have uh you know they're seeing the world through through our and our members eyes um and so you know that's that's also a really important i'd say ingredient is is the 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 human element to all of this and who who has these jobs and uh what their priorities are yeah 
And to close this out, I, I decided to go back to the website here and the landing page, and it's scrolling through. And uh, I wanted to note that uh, and remind folks, yes, if you're if from the, the Pittsburgh area, please join the movement, become a member, make a donation, um, contribute. But I also wanted to, to point out here that uh, uh, it, it's right here on the page that you guys are striving to make Pittsburgh a better place to, to bike and walk. And mm-hmm. so it, it really is, it, it, sometimes we, we see um, the advocacy organizations being laser focused on just biking and not really thinking about uh, the streets are for people and thinking about the walking side of things. Um, and so it was very encouraging to see that that was all so right up front and, and, and present there. Uh, do you also have a, 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 a pedestrian uh, safety uh walking advocacy organization in uh in pittsburgh or are you guys kind of it we're kind of it um so uh you know we do plenty around i think a lot of our uh, advocacy around traffic calming and things like curb bump outs and uh even even like arguably just as if not more important uh zoning code changes that allow for uh, walkable communities and less driving, yeah, uh, yeah. less parking, things like that is yeah. all wrapped up in our, our advocacy around walking. Yeah. It's, it's just the way that I think that advocacy should be done is it's not as siloed into this is all we focus on. It's like, no, we're talking about, you know, mm-hmm. livable streets here. We're talking about making exactly. you know, places, you know, for people. Scott Bricker, founder of Bike Pittsburgh and executive director, uh, 20 some odd years Congratulations on uh, making that anniversary. And thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this uh, conversation with Scott Bricker. Uh, I always have a good time uh, chatting with uh, Scott. And uh, if, if you did too, <laughs> please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Uh, leave a comment down below. And, uh, and if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just be sure to click on the subscription button and the uh, bell next to it, which gives you the opportunity to customize your notifications. And a quick more reminder, if you have a chance, uh, pop on over to the Active Town store to check out some of our fun streets for people swag out there. Uh, we've lowered the prices on everything out there. So uh, pop on over there, take a look at the t-shirts, water bottles, all that other good stuff. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Again, we don't make a lot of money um, off of that, but it gives me the opportunity to uh, you know, spread the word about the Active Towns uh, channel here and, uh, and, and the movement to create a culture of activity. So any support you can give is very much appreciated, including becoming a patron on the Patreon page. Uh, so pop on over to patreon.com slash active towns and uh, be super honored if you can help support a dollar a month, two dollars a month, five dollars a month, twenty five dollars a month. Again, I've got one person. Thank you. <laughs> and we really appreciate any support you're able to provide. Well, that's it for now. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers.